Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. First, I hope you will take time to read the note that uh, Shelby sent the congregation. Uh, it's a wonderful little message of her thoughts and feelings for our celebration for her a couple of weeks ago. Second, there are two um, listening devices that have seemed to walk away. Uh, we have four of them. Two of them are in the sanctuary right now. Two of them are probably sitting on somebody's counter at home, completely forgotten to put it back. If you have one of the two missing listening devices, would you please bring it back next Sunday if you possibly can? Thank you. Um, next week I will be out. Uh, Chris Scott, who is a um, minister in our presbytery, and I believe he lives in Prattville, he and his family will come over. His wife is a chaplain in the, Ar in the Air Force. So I uh, hope you all will enjoy him and welcome him as you have welcomed me into your arms. Also, Steve will be out as well, and Russell will be here playing for Steve. So uh, y'all will get a special treat for both of us. Um, we get a special treat to be away, and y'all get a special treat to have guests. Um, Barbara is the elder on call this week. I will be out of pocket Wednesday to Wednesday, basically. So if there is an emergency, please call her, and she will call me if there is something that I need to know. I will be honest with you, hers is the only phone number I will answer um, while I'm on vacation. There's, not to be rude to y'all, but... Uh, it's something I learned from my dad that when you're on vacation, you need to be present on vacation with your family unless there is an immediate big deal. So if there's an immediate big deal, she'll know, and if she'll also know if it's something that she can wait till next Wednesday to call me and tell me. So uh, please use the elder on call in the next week if uh, you need, need me for anything. Um, other than that... Our normal schedule for both the next two Wednesdays, the art scene will meet here on uh, 6 o'clock on Tuesday. And I believe that's all. We have a couple of people we can take off our prayer list at, as praises that they are both doing better, Hannah Stanton and Sue Weekelblack. So please uh, say a prayer of thanksgiving to God that, they, that the people who put them on the list felt that they are up to being taken off. That's always a joy to be able to do. It's one of the best things, in my opinion, as a minister, to be able to take somebody off a prayer list um, for good reasons. Are there any other announcements that need to be made known at this time? Okay, I would like to call forward the members of the Living Waters team who are going to tell us a little bit about their project the past uh, couple of weeks. It's obviously going to be very difficult to condense seven wonderful days of uh, mission work in the Dominican Republic into five minutes, but we're going to try to do that. Uh, and the first thing to assist us in that is that Teresa has said that she's going to let Zoe take her time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that'll, that's a, that will be a, a plus from the standpoint of time. Uh, but I'm sure you will hear from Teresa, maybe at the Women of the Church or at WOW, when we, uh, when we have, have an opportunity and have been showing at, with the men of the church uh, yesterday uh, some of the uh, video and film that we have from the mission trip. It's pretty exciting, so I'd like, if, if any opportunity available for you to be either at, at WOW or perhaps Women of the Church or the next meeting of the men of the church, which actually is not going to be until August. Uh, but we, we will continue to show you some of the some of the films that was there. We were in Paso Bejito, uh, which is a small community outside of Harabacoa, up in the mountains, somewhere around 4,000 feet or so, and and so that that's about the uh, the elevation of most of, of the uh, of the communities in the Smoky Mountains. That'll give you an idea of what what it looked like. Very very mountainous, absolutely gorgeous. And the village is a uh, probably, I would say, somewhere between 400 and 600 people throughout the area. Uh, the, uh, the church that we were working with uh, has, uh, I think, somewhere in the vicinity of about uh, uh, 40 to 50 members. Uh, and that's who we were uh, working with to provide the uh, clean water. The, uh, 
the one thing that I would like to comment on is that we have borrowed from the Dominican Republic uh, a phrase that you see on the front of our bulletin. We've changed it a little bit. Conocer a Dios y hacer dos conocido, which is uh, to, to know God and to make God known, or to know Christ and to make Christ known. The one thing that I felt the whole time that we were there uh, was that that phrase is, we, we can reverse it uh, in order. In order for us to know God, we have to be making God known. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what happened to us there. I have never felt as close to the Lord uh, as I felt there because we were working with a group of people who were expressing themselves to us in making God known to us. Uh, and with that, I'd like to ask, maybe ask Bill uh, and then Zoe and Richard to come and say a, a few words about the trip. But well, Jim sort of touched on what I wanted to talk about, and that is the feeling that you get when you're in the Dominican Republic and working with the people down there and the closeness to God that you feel. And it's sort of um, strange that today is Pentecost Sunday and I had uh, a Pentecost experience of sorts in the Dominican Republic, not on this past trip, but one of the earlier trips where I really came to understand a little bit more about Pentecost and what transpired then. But that's another story. I'll tell you about it later. But that emphasizes what Jim is saying, that you feel that when you're in the Dominican Republic, when you're down there with the people, uh, with Hoel at his mission station and then in the communities, you feel that closeness and that um, touch with God. You feel that closeness. The other thing that impressed me um, is the relationship of, of the ministry. You know, our ministry here is living waters. We go out install a clean water system. But in turn, we have a partnership or a working relationship with Hoel and his ministry in the Dominican Republic, Youth with a Mission is his. And he in turn has a relationship with this church. So by extension, we extend our ministry through Hoel and Hoel through to, to uh, the Casa de Refugio, the House of Refuge Church that we work with. And also at this time, we also incorporated uh, John Scholl from Cahaba Springs Presbyterian Church went with us. So as I think about it, I think about how many times we multiply this, this blessing and whatever throughout not only our ministry in our church and what we do here, but through on to Hoel, on through the church there in Paso Bajito that we work with, and also Cahaba Springs Presbyterian Church that participated with us. And that's what really hit home with me about it. Since I'm reporting for Teresa and me, I think I get two minutes. But anyway, I'm trying to keep this brief. Our part in the program uh, when we go on these trips is to first introduce a biblical story in the morning and have prayers and welcome the people that we are uh, in contact with. And usually this involves a little hilarity because we act out some of the plays. We've done that here as a demonstration for the Red Sea. And um, they love it. Even with the language barrier, they get it. And uh, each of our stories are related to water. We start with the creation, then the Red Sea, and then the woman at the well. Then we go into our teaching lessons, which tell them the importance of using this pure water that will come from this installation. And they get it. They understand the value of that. Um, this happens time and again. We don't go too far afield on our itinerary that we cover each day. Uh, they get a good look at the system. Uh, Bill touched on John Scholl joining us from Cahaba Springs. They contributed financially to this trip but another thing they did is their Presbyterian women sent a suitcase of the little pillowcase dresses that are sent around the world as mission projects throughout our church worldwide. And 
they were adorable with the lace that ties up over the shoulders and the little girls warm to our celebration. But each lady was able to pick out a dress for a child that she knew and also matching flip-flops, which they love. So that was a really wonderful extension of what we did. Uh, John also had a contact with a friend at the Gideons and sent down the little New Testaments in Spanish. And they were well received, not only at the church service we attended with them on Sunday, but throughout the week we made sure that everyone who attended received a New Testament. And they were so delighted, they, most of them did not have one. And so this was a real avenue, and we were so grateful for their participation with us this year. I would like to share with you this morning something that impressed me uh, while I was there working with the team and uh, in Paso Bajito. I w and let me back up just a minute. I was riding down the road. I don't know if it was this week or week before. I've lost track of time since I've been back, but I've been listening to the Bible on tape some. Uh, and I was listening to uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and it, Paul was talking about the body and how the body has different members and different parts. And it just kind of, a, a bell rang, and it kind of hit me about our team and how our team worked together, kind of like a body. You know, Paul said the body has eyes and ears, nose, mouth, hands, feet. Um, and, and also it said in that scripture, if the foot were to say, I'm not an eye, uh, I'm not important, I don't need to be part of the body. Well, that's not true. The foot has a function too. Uh, and it takes all those members and all those parts working together to make the body function uh, in 100% capacity. So when we got down there and we got our supplies together and we headed up in the mountains and we got there that first day, uh, Bill lined us out. He's, he's head of the team. Uh, he knows the system backwards and forwards. He's put them in. So he lined us all out on what needed to be done. And uh, it was just amazing how we're all blessed with different talents. You know, um, I've got members in my family that have musical talents. I have members in my family that have artistic talents. They can draw and paint. Um, I've got members of my family, doctors and lawyers. But I was blessed with the talent of just being a jack of all trade and a master of none. That's, that's what God blessed me with. That's my talent. So I was able to go in there and help, as Bill pointed out, directions on putting together PVC parts and uh, screwing up stuff on the board and starting to install things as things were put together. But uh, something else that, that, that hit me was that we're, we were the team. We went down there, yes, and we installed the system. But without the congregation and without the members of this church and the spiritual and the financial support, that you give, then there would have been no need for us to go down there. There wouldn't have been a project. There wouldn't have been a mission because the, long, the heart of this church and the long arms and the hands of this church are the ones that reach out and make it possible to touch those people down there in Paso Bajito. So I just want to thank each one of you for making this possible, uh, for your love for Living Waters and your support for Living Waters because it's really been a blessing to me. Uh, I feel like I, I got more out of it than the people in Dominican Republic did. It's just such a blessing. The Lord touched my life in so many different ways, and, and I, I appreciate each one of you for your support. Thank you all. Friends, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ rose for us, and now Christ intercedes with the Father for us. 
So let us turn now to the Lord, confessing our sins. First, together, we will read the prayer in the bulletin, followed by a silent time of confession. Let us pray together. O God, giver of the Spirit, we sit surrounded by red and hear the amazing story of Pentecost this morning. But we've heard it so many times before. It is so familiar, we cease to be amazed and surprised or filled with excitement. Forgive us for our complacency. Blow us out of our complacency. Let the fangs of passion dance in our lives. Inspire us with visions and dreams. Help us appreciate each gift you give us. Help us be truly Pentecost people. Amen. God has promised to send us the Spirit that we might fully know God's presence in the world and in our lives. Know that the Spirit of forgiveness and understanding flows over us this day and always. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Let us pray together. O God, open our hearts and minds and souls to hear your word as if for the first time. Help us experience anew the surprise and joy that your presence in the word can bring us. Amen. Our first of two New Testament readings comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3b through 13. It will sound very familiar to you since Richard basically talked about it five minutes ago. So we are all on the same page today on Pentecost, which is what the Spirit does. Let us listen to Paul's words to us. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. And to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. <clears throat> to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now our second New Testament reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. And this is what Bill referred to. Let us hear God's word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered. Because each one of them heard in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each of us hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed and said to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, 
and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to your Pentecost people. Thanks be to you, O Lord, for this word of wonder and delight. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be worthy and acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, I'm honestly tempted very tempted to say our sermon came before the prayer of confession. Use the four speeches that we heard about the work in the Dominican Republic and call it a morning. But it's 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and it's my job to come up here and give you a good word. I had a preaching class in seminary. It was my second semester in seminary. In my first semester in seminary, I was in classes with this girl. I can't even remember her name right now. She didn't last the three years in seminary. But she was always late on every assignment. Our first semester, she would go to professors and ask for more time, days, sometimes even week ext weeks extensions. And now, that frustrated me for a couple of reasons. One, I'm kind of like a by-the-rule type of person. If somebody tells me I've got to have something done by this time, by goodness, if I don't sleep for three days, it's going to be done by that certain time. But the other frustrating thing was is that these professors, and they were showing God's grace, so I can understand that, would let this woman turn in things days, weeks later. So we get to preaching class the second semester. And the very first day, the two professors of the class, Dr. Chuck Campbell and Dr. Anna Carter Florence, they come in and they talk, start talking about what we're going to be doing in preaching class and they're going to separate us into groups of about 12, etc. Because we had a class of about 75. So they would separate us into groups of 12 and meet with us in smaller groups. So, but one of the things they said is that when you come to Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, they didn't know, hey, can we push the deadline back to Tuesday? And then they said, if you don't, have a sermon ready when it's your time to preach in class, you will receive a zero for the class. Okay? So they tell us this the very first day. So, we get to about halfway through the semester. She actually was placed in my group of 12. Um, and she is assigned to preach at 1030 on Tuesday morning. We come into class. She had the first 20 minutes. Then somebody else had the second 20 minutes and somebody else had the third 20 minutes. I wasn't scheduled to preach until like a week later. And this is our second sermon. And she comes in and she's supposed to preach at 1030 on Tuesday and she does not have her sermon ready. And she refuses to go up and preach it. And my professor, Dr. Carter Florence, wonderful woman, lost it. I mean, I've never seen a professor go after a student in the way she went after that student that day. And I think about this when I think about Pentecost because that's what Peter basically does. Peter doesn't have anything prepared. Peter's not ready. But the Spirit hits, he goes out, and he says the word. He says the word anyway. And see, I've had a history of almost with sermons. I'm going to tell you all about three of them. First, when I was still in seminary, one of the other things you have to do is you have to plan a week of chapel with three other people. So there was four of us. Two of you preach, two of you don't preach. There's only two days during the week that you preach. The other two days you have some type of arts part of a service. So you get all these different functions, but you plan it together. Well, I'm one of the two in my group who gets assigned to preach. Actually, I wanted to preach. And up until that point in my life, I preached by a script. OK? 
Okay? We're about in October of my third year in seminary. And I have half a sermon, and it's 11 o'clock at night. The night before I'm supposed to preach at 11 a.m. the next morning. So I am freaking out. I have no idea what to do. And so I had a friend. Her name is Kim Losey. And Kim said, John, let's go to the chapel. And so we go over to the chapel that I was supposed to preach in the next morning. She's like, okay, go up and preach what you got. So I got there, and I preached, and I get to that point, and she said, now keep going. And I was like, what? She's like, just keep going. Don't write anything down, just keep going. So, you know, I preached for a few more minutes. And then she's like, okay, you got a sermon. You can go to bed now. I'll see you tomorrow. I was like, what? She's like, just do that tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I didn't have any other time. I was, I was running out of time, and I had to preach at 11 o'clock the next morning. So I got up, and I delivered the sermon. Well, my second one is my first year working in Hartzell. And the office was kind of like here. It's off to the back and the side of the little sanctuary. Now, it's a much smaller sanctuary. Hartzell's a very, very small church. Okay, well, I come up. I do all the stuff. We get to the sermon. And the outline's not there. By that point, I'd gone to outlines because I'd learned I could do this stuff. Well, the outline's not on the pulpit. And I look around, and a guy named Sam Gugliotta, who was an elder at the church, great man, but he was a practical joker. I thought he had moved the sermon, and so I looked at him, and I was like, he looked at me like, what are you doing? Like, Did you move the sermon? And he was like, no. And so, come to find out, I left it on the desk back there. But I had to preach, even though I had no sermon. So, I made something up and went along. <laughs> you know, um, you have to preach. And so we get to today, we get to Pentecost, and Pentecost is such a hard Sunday to preach. And it's a hard Sunday to preach because you want to try to gather the excitement of the passage. You want to convey the joy that is going on. But at the same time, sometimes you're not there, although I am, I'm in a good mood. But sometimes the people aren't there. Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was a minister in the Metropolitan Church in New York City, probably the most famous minister of the early 20th century in the United States, always said that the sermon was worthless if it didn't meet the people's needs in the pews. That you can be as academic and wonderful or expository on the text, but if it doesn't meet the needs of your people, why are you preaching it? And so today we come to this passage and sometimes I feel like I know what to say to the congregation, but today I didn't. I just didn't know. I couldn't put it together. And then I heard the people come up, you know, Jim and Bill and Zoe and Richard, and it's like, well, they just kind of said what needed to be said for Pentecost. Because here our church, infused by the Spirit, in a sense of togetherness as a communal work, went out and did God's work. Except not only did they go and do God's work, they were transformed by doing God's work. It wasn't just that they transformed others' lives, but we heard it from themselves. They were transformed by their work. The passage in Acts starts when it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. They were all together. They were the body of Christ doing the work together. So we sent eight or nine people to the Dominican Republic, but in a way we all went because we are the body of Christ working together. They used the gifts that God gave them. But the rest of us use other gifts that God has given us to work together, to be together. Too often in the United States, we focus on individualism. We focus on the individual. And I could go into all my spiel about how I hate that because such things as dress codes at school. Well, we've got to give them individuality. No, we don't. Put them in uniforms. 
You know, we have to let people go out and do whatever they want to do. Well, no, not really, because a lot of things people want to do will actually hurt themselves and others. You know, we ask, well, we don't necessarily ask as Presbyterians, but the question is asked a lot, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Friends, there's much more evidence in the Bible that salvation is a communal activity, not an individual activity. That's what happens in Acts. It's a communal activity that the Spirit comes and is placed on all of them who are meeting together. Not just the very most faithful one. Because after all, Peter, like I told you, I had a New Testament professor who called Peter, James, and John the three stooges because they could never get anything right. And yet the Spirit is bestowed upon this guy, the one who denies Jesus three times, the one who chops off a guy's ear. Because it's a communal activity. They are all infused with the Spirit. And so our group, our church, sent people to the Dominican Republic to do God's work. But we all were there because we are the body of Christ. And what we do is communal work. We do communal work together. I'm going to end with another little story from yesterday. My son Teddy, who's 14, has decided he is going to be a basketball player. And all he does is dribble, shoot, play, dribble, shoot, play, dribble, shoot, play. Now, unfortunately for Teddy, he is gifted with the Brock sense of height. Um, but determination is completely there. So anyways, we get, we're going to a basketball tournament that he's playing in. I was in Atlanta yesterday. I went to one of his games. And one of the teams that was playing in this tournament wasn't the one they were playing against. Had a shirt on, t-shirts as they were going to warm up that said, one plate, but we all eat. And at the time, I just was thinking, ooh, that's a cool slogan to put on my girls' soccer program t-shirts for next year. One plate, but we all eat. But then I thought about Pentecost, and I thought about communion, and I thought about the Spirit and the fact that we work communally. And that the Spirit, in a way, is like the plate. The Spirit gifts us all. And each of us have a part to play in this body of Christ. But we all eat. And it's a wonderful thing for us as the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to the table... Remind us that we are yours, we are your children, that we are also each other's as a part of this body of Christ. Give us strength to continue to do your work. Continue to give us your spirit to enhance our gifts for each other and for your people. And let us be filled by this meal as we go forward into your world as your disciples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So friends, I ask you to stand and let us say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed that is found in your, in your hymnal. My friends, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Oh, we might go to the third verse. Please be seated. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. For the gift of your spirit in our lives and in our church, O oh Lord, we give you thanks. For the gifts you give each of us to create your beloved community here on earth, we give you thanks. For all of creation, that it may be honored and preserved and protected, we give you thanks. For the leaders of our nation and all nations of the world, that they may be guided with wisdom and understanding and committed to act in ways that bring your presence and peace. Come, Holy Spirit, come. For all places where there are wars and rumors of wars, for those places where hunger gnaws, for those places ruled by oppression and injustice, for those places where hatred overcomes love, come, Holy Spirit, come. Where dreams have died and visions are squelched, Renew their spirits with your passionate fire. Come, Spirit, come. For all who are ill, whether in body, mind, or spirit. For all who mourn, whether for the loss of loved ones, the loss of a job, or even the loss of faith. Fill them with your spirit of compassion and strength and healing, that they might know they are never alone. Spirit, make us Pentecost people who reach out in love and in caring. And for all that you have given and will yet give, we give you thanks. May we always be open to your spirit. Now let us continue praying to our Lord using the prayer the disciples were taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pentecost people, we have received gifts too numerous to count. And now we have a chance to give and thanks and enjoy. Your offering will enable this church to be a Pentecost presence in this community and the world. To reach out in passionate commitment and to bring the wind and the fire of the Spirit to a people and a world that so desperately needs it. Let us receive now God's tithes and our offerings.
You have been viewing the Sunday morning worship service from the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. The First Presbyterian Church is located in Eufaula, Alabama at 201 North Randolph Avenue, Eufaula, Alabama, 36027. The church phone is 334-687-2523. That number again, 334-687-2523.
2523.